welcome. Today we have with us Dr. Philip Snell, and uh, he is teaching a couple of courses for us here in Somatic Senses uh, up in Canada. The first of his courses in Calgary, May 4th to 5th, and the second of his courses in Vancouver, October 5th to 6th. And the title of that course is The Clinical Companion to FixYourOwnBack.com. And so what we're going to start with before we really get into the detail here is exactly why it is named the clinical companion to fixyourownback.com. And for that story, I will hand it over to Dr. Snell. <laughs> nice to chat with you, Ben. Um, uh, yeah, I get that question uh, a little bit. The, probably the biggest thing that people should know is uh, the, the site, fixyourownback.com, is not for you. <laughs> it's not uh it wasn't designed for the people that are likely to be watching this video who, whom we assume are probably clinicians like ourselves and are um interested in learning a little more about uh, ways to improve their practice uh the site itself was put together by me in response to a patient uh, interaction years ago where after working him from an eight out of ten uh, low back pain uh, for six or eight months uh, to pulling weight off of the floor. And he was a big burly guy that kind of identified with spending a lot of time in the, uh, in the gym under weight. Um, he literally broke down and cried in front of me. And he said, uh, where in the hell was I supposed to learn this? And it was at that point that I realized, because I've been through the disc herniation process as well, um, I've experienced that pain that brings the person up short, makes them question their ability to be able to make a living, question all of their security issues and such. And uh, I agreed with him um, because I had to kick over a lot of stones to find an, a, a path and make some of those paths myself in the process of getting myself out of the weeds. So... Um, Fast forward that, uh, that site online and, and me talking about that site online attracted over the years the attention of other clinicians. They were like, you know, how do you, how do you what do you do? Is it just McKinsey? Because a lot of people think, oh, Snell, he's just using this McKinsey thing. You know, you're getting people from an 8 out of 10 down to a very low pain. You're probably just using an MDT, MDT intervention. And that is indeed part of what we lead with with an acute patient. Um, or even a subacute or chronic patient for that matter, um, if, if the, the testing and the assessment suggests it. But um, it, it, it goes um, way far afield from McKinsey there and things that probably a lot of McKinsey folks would be like, wait, what? What did he just do? Why did he do that? And those things, uh, some of those things include on the very first treatment, uh, exposing a person to uh, deadlifting form uh, when they often um, admit that they are uh, quite worried about the effects that that might have on their back. And so I'm borrowing from literally in the first visit, I counted this up once, I think there's six different schools of rehab and, and veins of research that are applied just in the rehab portion. Uh, and seeing that patient for the first time. So uh, in response to those clinicians' questions of, um, of how do I do this, I put together the course that uh, you guys at Somatic Senses are hosting me for for two courses. And um, folks that are interested can, uh, I assume, find a, a link somewhere associated with this uh, production that they can uh, join us there learn a bit more. That'd be a lot of fun. Yes. So the clinical companion to fix your own back.com is the title, but the subtitle is assessment and exercise intervention for the flexion intolerant and disc injured low back. Yeah, but that's uh, way too many words. Ben. It's a lot of words. <laughs> yeah. You could have made it into a, a really funding sound, funny sounding shortened version, but yeah. Um, yeah, we did. I just wanted to explain all that getting into this. So from uh, our previous conversations, and uh, the point of this conversation is to explain uh, what you described previously as a, your current unified field theory of low back pain. And uh, I know when you sent me the, the title of it, I just kind of jumped all over it being an Einstein fan and having you know read his biography and all these different things. It's, um, 
something I went, went, ooh, that sounds, that sounds like my kind of learning and hence the reason we're here talking about it. Um, so uh, whenever you're ready and feel like explaining it, by all means, I, I'd love to hear your unified field theory of low back pain. <laughs> <laughs> um, why, thank you for asking. Well, let's give, <laughs> let's give, the, uh, let's give the, the viewers here something a little bit pithy because I know some of you that are watching this will look at the heat maps on this video afterwards probably and see we've already lost half the audience with that uh, initial lame lead in. <laughs> but uh, but right. hopefully for those of you that are uh, hanging out still, we'll give you something a little bit pithy. Um, this is an, some ideas that I've been playing with over the years and uh, quite honestly, um, looking at low back pain, uh, my own personal experience with it made me question a lot about the way that I was taught about how it was, uh, about how it came to be, about how the injury comes to be. So quite honestly, there's been a, a lot of, of very, um, uh, I don't know, humble introspection of, uh, and questioning some sitting still and asking, what is it that the body is trying to do when presented with this particular problem? Is it trying to get away from it? Is it trying to get towards something else? So in the process of mulling that over for a number of years, I came up with um, uh, something that looks like this. this is, I, I don't think I've ever gone to this particular site to pull this up and it didn't fumble, fart, and fall somehow. So hopefully this will be a little bit different. Uh, but we will uh, we'll give it a shot here and see if it actually works. So I'm going to screen share with you guys. Lo and behold, look at that. First time through. We've got um, it. So uh, notice at the top, uh, this is the, what I refer to as the domino effect of most low back pain, not all low back pain. If it was 100%, you know, there'd be, uh, I'd be seeing people out the, the window here next to my home, uh, all lined up all the way to my office, uh, two miles away. Um, but uh, I do think this represents a relatively um, decent hypothesis about what is going on with back pain, um, all back pain. And uh, you guys can take it for, for what it's worth and you know uh, respond however you like. But uh, at the course, sometimes I will lead with this and uh, almost like some of those, you know, TV shows where they show you the end first and then they uh, spend the rest of the series working through that. Uh, I found that's a nice way. So you guys will get a chance to see where we actually begin the course uh, right here. And that course, by the way, is two days, 12 hours, and it's certified for continuing education. So if you want to get some benefit from it, here it goes. So let's see what we put together here. Um, now, given that I've got this toolbar up here, are you able to see this, Ben? Are you able to see the entire slide? Okay. Yes, I can. Yep. Um, this is a little bit wishy-washy, admittedly. Threat. What is threat? Um, we don't have a real solid uh, understanding of what represents threat in the human organism. And when we talk about it in the, in the field of psychology, usually it has to do with fear and fear avoidance and things of that sort. But this um, makes the most sense to me. I found myself over the years gravitating towards a central question that would come up to me before I walked into the room with every single patient. I kind of take a deep breath, shake everything off from the previous patient encounter, get myself set to do, you know, give the person that I'm getting ready to interact with my A game. And then I'd ask myself a simple question. Where is the threat? Where is it primarily? And my world um, being very neurocentrically organized and clinical practice, uh, that threat could present itself to a variety of different neural tissues. It could present at the cortical level. Uh, it could present uh, uh, as uh, belief systems and culturation or whatever about their pain, prior experiences about their pain. It could present at the spinal level by uh, um, reactions to or actions on the spinal cord or nerve roots. Um, it could 
um, be as a result of something going on in the peripheral compartment, um, thinking larger caliber, uh, typically mixed, uh, uh, mixed nerves, or it could even uh, occur as a part of a uh, smaller caliber neurology, superficial cutaneous neurology that pings enough and long enough to cause central um, adaptation. And we've got good evidence of that in animal and human models to suggest that that process is uh, in play. So I think that back pain in and of itself typically happens because a threat is presented at the segmental level in the spine and is viewable as a threat primarily to the neural tissue that allows the human being to hunt and gather, the spinal cord and the nerve roots. And I suspect that a lot of what we see and a lot of what we're trained to deal with in back pain is um, our manifestations of adaptations that the body is trying to make in response to that threat. So what's the nature of these threats? Well, we could have anatomical instability that could cause um, uh, the secondary stabilizers to try to intervene and, uh, and often in a spasmodic sort of way to try to keep uh, injury from happening to those particular structures. It could be from mechanical compression owing to an osteophyte or an osteophyte complex or to a, uh, a disc uh, could have, as we've spoken off camera, uh, something to do with the resultant mix and interplay there of traction effects as the body moves, the, and traction being uh, sufficient enough to disrupt blood flow, perfusion, and cause venous congestion in the nerve root. It could be because of local inflammation to other structures, maybe a ligamentous injury or the disc itself being injured and causing um, inflammatory cytokines and chemokines to be re released in that area that could then secondarily uh, cause a radiculitis. But the main thrust of this, I think most of what you and I were taught in school about how to deal with back pain is actually dealing with reactions and adaptations of the initial presentation of this threat. Let's look at how that plays out. We were both instructed quite well in school of how to deal with frank nerve root compression, a radicular process. And we learned all of our tests and all of our neural tests uh, to try to deal with that. And we might even have looked at downstream effects of things like, you know, piriformis muscle and piriformis syndrome. Don't get me started on that because I, I don't know that I, more than once or twice in my career have I seen a frank piriformis syndrome. So if you're out there treating piriformis syndrome viewers, um, you might want to come and join us for a weekend <laughs> and, and see another way. Yeah, I've um, never actually treated it. Not, not, not even yeah. once have I caught it and gone, that's definitely a piriformis syndrome. Yeah, beyond, beyond going, you know, going down this long, drawn-out process of how you know, the piriformis is working too much in the gait cycle to take up for other muscles that aren't. And, uh, yeah, there's all kinds of loose biomechanical uh, uh, putative measures that have been thrown at that, and uh, most of them are left sadly lacking. Um, but then we have observed uh, hypertonicity of muscles downstream that are innervated by the uh, nerve roots that most commonly are affected with uh, disc injury in the low back, the hamstrings and the triceps sura. So we got good training on all of that but when it comes to things like this and what we were we were taught um the think about the aforementioned piriformis syndrome the innervation of that muscle is actually nerve roots that come from the most commonly injured segments in the lumbar spine uh the calf strain that weird calf strain that we see often that comes up in runners where they'll uh repetitively strain uh, that the, uh, those particular muscles after uh, when they run seemingly for no good reason. They stretch everything just fine, but this keeps popping back up. And then tarsal tunnel syndrome and plantar fasciitis uh, conditions that oftentimes show up in runners as well as chronic, but are often unexplored as neurogenic issues. And um, I, I think that if you have the eyes to see it, often these conditions, these syndromes, 
uh, if you trace them back to the spine, you will often find um, uh, causal features there, that if you remove those causal features, then these chronic conditions that are all the way at the other end of the kinetic chain uh, start to get better or frankly go away. Um, one of the more common things that we spend our time uh, focusing on are the effects of muscles in response to this. And we're gonna get to that in just a moment. But there are other tissues we don't think about in the way that they might respond and remodel, like fascia. And fascia, as you guys know, from a physics perspective, responds to, to tensile loading by biggering, um, to pull a Dr. Seuss out there. Um, it, they get, it gets more robust, and that's good. That's adaptation. I mean, you know, working with power lifters that I do, I see that on a regular basis when you put your hands on these people. Uh, of course, putting your hands on people these days is thoroughly um, against protocols anymore because we all know that we can't feel anything. Um, Nothing whatsoever. I'm saying that, of course, <laughs> firmly tongue in cheek. But the, um, the fascial layer, the fascial compartment in these individuals is incredibly dense. And um, I've got stories I'll relate uh, that to in the course, but uh, they would take us too far afield here. But uh, uh, we've got um, people like Helene Langevin, uh, a medical doctor who does um, uh, acupuncture. I think, I think it's Western uh, needling as opposed to traditional TCM. But she noted on ultrasound examination that people with chronic lower back pain as compared to controls the lumbodorsal fascia is 25% thicker in those individuals. And that does not necessarily mean that the fascia is pathological and we don't all need to be running out and investing in elaborate things to release that fascia. Um, the fascial biggering is a good adaptation to load. But what if that process leads to mechanical interface problems with neurology, remember? neurocentric uh, uh, focus here. The, we've got, a uh, last time I checked, uh, a little over 15 papers out of Japan in just the last two or three years where they've explored the cluneal nerves, specifically the superficial and the middle cluneal nerves, and their involvement in chronic um, ongoing lower back pain. And I often see this to be comorbid with a disc issue. So you can have two flavors of pain that are coming up. And, and sadly, it seems like most of us, when we evaluate for low back pain in terms of tissue strata, if we get one thing, then we assume that that's primary and we, we roll with that. And I, I don't buy that. And we go chapter and verse on assessment in the course to look at each one of these compartments of neural tissue and then to prioritize how we're going to put a, an effective treatment plan uh, together for that individual in front of us. So, cluneal neuralgia, it's a thing. Learn about it, uh, we'll teach you about it, and how to make it better with the tools that you have. Now, back to the muscle stuff that we talked about. We all see this, you know, you see this in the antalgic position that patients present with when they've got uh, different flavors of back pain. Um, what I'm interested in here is kind of pointing out, again, these are ICD-10 codes that we learn for specific flavors of low back pain. Think about what happens uh, in a muscle response to um, a flexion intolerant pattern of back pain where the extensors will become hyper uh, or hypertonic and cause a hyperlordosis. And that hyperlordosis would then tend to load the lower lumbar facets and the upper lumbar facets a bit more. And the lower lumbar facets that can result in our uh, uh, lumbar facet syndromes that we learn about in school. And the upper uh, could result in main syndrome. Um, some circles, they refer to it as spinal segmental sensitization. And that um, also begins to encompass that um, cluneal neuralgia we were talking about, which Maine uh, described in a wonderful way going back into the 1970s. Um, as we look at the frontal plane and how antalgia can affect other uh, uh, arthrogenic um, downstream players, um, we would typically have, maybe with a lateral disc herniation, uh, so as in QL hypertonicity, and that could lead to, lead to that you know, John Wayne posture of that lateral tilt that you see of that person when they're walking down the hall. 
And in addition to what's going on at the spine downstream, we might often find that maybe that psoas hypertonicity um, could have an adverse effect on the uh, uh, femoroacetabular joint owing to the insertion of the psoas might cause that uh, femur to ride a little bit anterior in the acetabulum and cause essentially bruising or possibly even frank tearing of the, uh, the acetabular labrum at some point. Uh, the QL, by virtue of its attachments, partly on the, uh, the, the uh, iliac crest, theoretically, we might find, you know, the stuff that Gillet uh, talked about, uh, which, you know, has poor sensitivity and specificity on his tests, but in PT world, they refer to as a pelvic upslip, where the, the mechanics of that joint may be um, possibly... Uh, taken off kilter a little bit and result in another issue. This was one that gave me a lot of interest and, and was one of the pivot points for me. I had a patient whom I had been seeing for a uh, number of years um, and it was always kind of like, oh yeah, you know, my hip is out. My SI needs adjusting. And I would do what, you know, as, uh, as good chiropractors were taught in school and I would give him a well well-performed um, SI manipulation and I uh, get up off the table and say, yeah, you got it, doc. And he'd walk out and he'd be super happy about the way things were, were rolling for him right then. And then he'd come back a while later with that same issue. And then I had one or two of these patients to show up and I had all of the things that I was taught for assessment for ESI suggested that the SI was a source of nociception. It was arthrogenic, and coming from the SI, and it wasn't a sacroiliitis. So I was doing all the right things that I had been taught, and yet they would come back, a few of these people came back, maybe years down the road, and I'd be like, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Where you been? Uh, I said, well, you know, honestly, doc, I've, I've been feeling a bit better, but that's after I was feeling a whole lot worse. Um, I had this weird back pain. It was nothing like what I had previously been experiencing. It was um, really 10 times worse, and it had some, I had some sciatica and stuff with it, and I went and got an MRI. I found out I had a, uh, a disc herniation, and I had a microdiscectomy, and I've been fine since then. I've been feeling a hell of a lot better. And, uh, then, and that always made me pause, you know, when I would see that. It's, why didn't I see that disc herniation in process, is there a way to see it happening way before it actually becomes right up in your grill, something that is completely destroying your, uh, your day? So uh, for those of you that are just uh, hammering down the high spots of the SI joint, hey man, keep doing it. It's effective, but don't see it as the driver of the pain bus. This is usually in, you know, it's in one of the back seats. Okay. It's an, uh, more often than not, it's an artifact of other th bells that are ringing louder and causing the system to adapt. So next up, we've got uh, other issues in muscles. Uh, beyond just spasming, we all know and have paid exorbitant amounts of money to others with uh, three-letter acronyms associated with manual therapy techniques and uh, pay our due diligence or our dues on a, on a uh, yearly basis to keep our certification in those precious modalities to be able to uh, treat these interesting little critters here, the myofascial trigger points. But lo and behold, myofascial trigger points are under uh, that whole hypothesis from um, uh, uh, David Simons and uh, Janet Travell has always been a theory and it's always been a kind of a, you know, there's been some circular logic in the theory. And uh, these days we've got a very different vantage point about what a trigger point may or may not be um, out there from the folks like uh, David Butler, um, uh, uh, Bove, Quintner, Cohen. Um, these folks are considering that a trigger point might actually be a small nerve that is mechanically interfacing poorly somehow with the tissues that it's going through and that 
poor mechanical interface is resulting in either frank compression or tension to the point that the nerve is exhibiting um, uh, mechanical sensitivity. And that mechanical sensitivity, since we can't really do tension tests for those things in the superficial and cutaneous compartment, is mostly we find it by using our hands and finding that the tissues are actually, um, uh, or the, the course of the nerve is actually tender. And in the case of back pain, some of the key players that we'll talk about in the course and that we often see in clinical practice that show up here are the ones that wrap around, that Maine talked about, the ones that wrap around the flank and into the groin, uh, into the, uh, the genital region, and down the anterior thigh, subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, lateral femoral cutaneous, and gen fem. So I guess what I'm trying to drive home is that my, my perception is that if you're treating these items in situ, if you're treating a trigger point, as the cause of pain or you're trigger or you're treating an SI as a cause of pain, I think we're missing the bus. Um, I think that the driver on that bus is typically this, a, a, pre, uh, a presented threat to major neurology that the body is in responding in for the health of the organism to allow it to continue to hunt and gather. It's um, a bit of aversive learning and the people that have this kind of stuff, they avoid doing activities that they uh, have learned will make them worse, like bending forward and like picking weight up. And we teach them how to do that in our clinic, and I'll teach you elegant ways that we've learned to be able to do that without um, setting people off and, uh, and injuring them. So the take home message out of all of this is be neurocentric in your practice and uh, look for those, uh, that unhappy neuro. When you do find evidence of unhappy neuro, evaluate the, the, the central, the peripheral, and the superficial compartments. Think about bigger to smaller nerves, brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, superficial cutaneous. Um, use your functional rehab training uh, to look for movement patterns that might be associated with why that sensitivity continues and try to put the brakes on that. Um, help to remedy that unhappy neuro with the manual therapy techniques and the other things that you've paid, you know, many thousands of dollars for machines that go bing, uh, hydrocolators and whatever. Use all that stuff to make the person feel better and to help them uh, feel less pain, but keep your freaking eye on the ball. The ball is the driver of the bus, that presented threat. Find that threat and fix it. And then of course, most importantly, at the end, teach your patient how to help themselves. So show them stuff that they can do at home, whether it's exercise or manual therapy. And we show both in the course uh, that you can show the patient how to do to fix this stuff on their own at home as best as possible and then lean on you beyond that. So there you have it, my friend. Um, that, is, uh, that is my weirdness. <laughs> That's how far that's how far down the garden path I've gotten. So come at me, bro. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't think weird would be the right word. I think, com I think more complete would be the right word. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, as, as we've talked about, I think one of the, uh, one of the issues that I, I personally have run into, and you know my story that I've told you before, and a lot of others have run into, um, is when you... Um, when you don't take a complete approach, because one of the things that you can end up doing is subscribing entirely to the logic of one approach. Um, and there are areas where you will end up sacrificing as a result of that. So um, just to, to quickly give my story again, although you know it, um, I had been taking the various levels of education through this uh, one specific company, and it was great, phenomenal, still use a lot of their tools to this day, but one of the things that came about as a result of this essentially was, even though I had a background um, understanding spine mechanics and understanding a lot of what McGill had been teaching, in this specific group and in this specific set of logic, it was essentially presented that you should be able to have flexion of the lumbar spine and you should be able to create motor control of it. Sure, probably not high velocity, high load lumbar flexion, but you should at least have access to it. And I showed up personally with a hyperlordotic lumbar spine that had been there as long as I could remember from the sports I was playing from all these different things. 
So sure enough, I kind of went down that pathway of um, ignoring a lot of these, uh, a lot of the other systems that I knew to integrate. Um, as you just presented, I kind of had a unified field theory, even though it wasn't complete in my head. Um, and I kind of chose to throw a lot of it out the window and subscribe temporarily for about six months time to the logic of one specific system because the logic made a lot of sense to me in isolation. Yeah. And so when I did that, as you know, fast forward about six months later, um, I started in the middle of a workout sans pain and with no idea it was coming, started getting a heel drop in the middle of a workout. And about an hour later had the horrible sciatic pain. Um, and you know, I had what I assume is one of the worst versions of it. You know, I took a long time for a lot of this crap to go away. And I mean, a disc herniation is just, it's not fun. It messes a lot of things up. And a lot of the reasoning for that is because, uh, you know, I had what I'd call an awareness of a lot of these peripheral systems. Um, and a lot of the things you talked about, uh, systems of learning and the, the different anatomy, both the microanatomy and the uh, macroanatomy, and kind of chose to ignore it temporarily and go, well, the logic I'm going to use for the next little while depicts that I should be able to flex my lumbar spine as long as it's not under load and it's not as long as long as it's not high repetition, I should be able to get away with it. Um, and there's there's danger in kind of, you know, if you if you were to see all the slides that you just put up, there's danger in sort of taking one slide and kind of plucking it out because it's a unified field theory, not a bunch of separate field theories. Um, and that is why I say, I, I don't think you're too far down that garden path. I think it's just a more complete way of looking at things. And the, the difficult part in being a, uh, a clinician that wants to operate in that complex level is not in understanding each one of those theories. It's in understanding just that the unification of these theories. Um, and as I asked yesterday and you kind of laughed and threw your hands up in the air, you said, hence this course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the, I, I guess, uh, comments in, in, um, in response to your, your process there. And, uh, and thanks for sharing that. That's, um, because it is, uh, it, once you start working this particular, um, process that we're playing, or I'm sorry, I'm speaking, um, uh, Canadian process that we're, um, <laughs> that that we're working here um the you will see a lot more of these patients that you didn't see before the you you said that my spine shouldn't flex well your spine should flex and you and i both know that yep. we know that it should flex and we know that it does flex under times where um as greg layman would would push us to observe um even under times when we're frightfully trying to keep it from doing that and, and that's not really important to my mind it's in the effort of trying to keep it from going to end range flexion we're actually protecting sensitive neural structures and that is a worthwhile endeavor yes um but the uh as to whether it should flex before someone pushed you into that algorithm of yeah your spine should flex and that that looks a whole lot like um, uh, some folks are familiar with toe touch progressions in one of the systems that's out there and there's nothing in the world. I've seen, I've seen that parlor trick done and it works. I've seen it done and it doesn't work so much. And the ones where it does it, uh, where it does work in all likelihood that hyperlordosis that you were exhibiting, maybe at that particular point in time at the, the coursework that you were doing might have been maladapt uh, maladaptive behavior that was left over from uh, something else, um, uh, maybe a prior injury or just the way that you had preferentially worked muscle groups. Um, but not knowing and just pushing a person into that, it appears, at least at face value, that likely the hyperlordosis was there as a protective response. And then the process of moving that, removing that hyper, uh, that protective response you exposed your body you know sensitive major neurology to injury and that of course causes an entirely different cluster f of um uh symptoms in the in the view of spasm which you know quite well, Very well. and i know you as well and know that you've got kids and young kids and um there's there's nothing that rocks your world like that to then to be able to start to see your child as a threat to your day because you can't pick them up. You can't go play with them. Um, yep. That's a, uh, that's a precious thing. So anyway, I, uh, that's uh, a couple of decent stories there, I think. And um, I very much enjoy uh, teaching this course. I 
think it is um, uh, with as much humility as I can muster. <laughs> I think it's uh, one of the better one of the better things out there to manage one of the most common things, uh, one of the most expensive things that we have in public health. And I think especially for the Kairos in the world out there uh, with our, shall we say, neurocentric bias, um, this is a way for, for uh, us as a profession to actually step up to the table to a current public health crisis that has been poorly managed through opiates and now has us in an interesting place in time of looking at, of, of the other side who's always cast stones at our profession, of looking at us as a possible answer to this. But if you're showing up to that party and manipulation is the only uh, tool that you brought, then uh, in this particular condition, you're going to fail miserably. So, yep, bring it, but don't. Don't yeah. make sure you bring other tools too. I completely agree. And that's uh, just to add one last little, you know, pump of your tires. I think the, one of the things that uh, as, as, as many people mature through their career, they, they start to see um, that mastery of, of one technique is great, but mastery of the integration of several techniques is the difficult part. Um, and watching to see where they unify and how they all work together. And that's one of the, one of the reasons that we reached out to you wanting to bring you in um, was specifically knowing that you have um, a background and an in-depth knowledge of the many different systems. Um, and that's one of the difficult parts about going to many different seminars out there is that they, they, they may or may not even acknowledge what everyone else is doing. And there's a few people in the industry, um, in physio, chiro, massage, strength and conditioning, that they do a great job of becoming these, these master integrators, rather than these master proprietors of, uh, here's, the, here's the one cupcake I'm going to sell. It's, you know, here, I'm going to show you how to bake a whole bunch of different things. Um, and that's, that's a very useful thing to show up to, even if you come from a background like I do, where you, you've done a lot of DNS, you've done McGill, you've done McKenzie, you, you've done the FMS and the SFMA, and you come from this, that, and the other background. Um, because the real finesse, uh, a lot of the time, comes in the advanced integration of these things, knowing what to use when with great confidence. Um, and that's something that I think um, is, is something that is, it's very important to get into rooms with other people that that's the goal, that that's what they're trying to do. Um, and that's something, you know, I look forward to about your course. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. The, uh, I think the competence part in this particular case is, is, um, is a precious point as well. Um, these are the patients that are typically in our type of MSK practice, they will typically be the worst pain cases that you're going to see. And it's, uh, I think it was Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until you get hit in the face. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and they are the punch straight into your uh, academic face. And it's very, it, it, it's, it's very easy for people in our world um, with our, our, uh, the way our training is organized to get the entire way through your program and never have seen an acute disc presentation. Yep. And, uh, when you're, you know, out there doing on the job training in your practice and, uh, somebody walks in like this and they are in the worst pain of their life and all of their, uh, security issues are at threat and you're kind of winging it. Um, that's a tough spot to be in. Um, and this course will allow you very quickly to be able to walk in in a very competent manner with that person and knock it out of the park. Um, my associate, Dr. Corey Peterson, uh, Dr. John Parker in the past, Dr. Uh, Justin Dean, uh, Dr. Ben Ramos and such, uh, these guys know that when, when these patients would come in, you know, and the staff would come in and they're like, oh man, this one's in a, this person's in a whole lot of pain out there. And they're, you know, they're, they can barely get up into the, into the building. And all. We look at the, sh the sheet, we see what they put down and we just smile. Um, there's, there's no way around it. We just smile because we know that in the next hour, we're going to challenge their biases about why they hurt. We're going to challenge their biases about their, uh, about how they should and should not move. Um, and we're going to make them feel a hell of a lot better 
and we're going to get another Christmas card. <laughs> it's so, all about the Christmas cards at the end of the all day. All about the Christmas cards, man. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this this course is um, it's not exclusively for geeks, but if you are a geek and you're not hanging out with us, then you know, phooey on you. Yeah, because um, the the geeks in this case would be the people that have already done the work of the those individual silos that we've mentioned, whether it's um, McGill's work, which is you know paramount whether it's mdt mckenzie's work which is absolutely great but what do you do about the mckenzie purgatory that um you know <laughs> people get left in mckenzie purgatory as the end all solution for things um the uh kettlebell work which you've done uh so much of and, and have a wonderful course on um the uh the the um the work of people like craig liebenson um in bringing all of this together um all of these things it's great when you go and do all of that coursework but then actually applying it for a specific condition that is the tough part and being able to, you know, to keep the balls in the air and uh, elegantly uh, manage that in this most painful condition that we're likely to experience is what the thrust of this course is about. Beautiful. Um, well, any last minutes parting words that we want to say? Nope, I'm done. Done. <laughs> You're like, I got to save it. I got 12 hours worth of talking to do here in a few weeks. Yeah. So, okay. Well, just to uh, recap for anyone that's watching, um, we've got two courses coming up with Dr. Snell. One of them is in Calgary the first weekend of May, and the other one is in Vancouver the first weekend of October. You can find those on somaticsenses.com. I'll throw up some links um, depending on where this is posted. You'll probably find it above or below. Um, and I look forward to seeing Dr. Snell there myself. And thank you for coming out. Thanks for the Great. talk. It's always right. a pleasure. Thanks, Ben. Likewise, my friend.